Today we're looking at saving to memory. For example, how does your DCC loco know what its maximum speed is or its acceleration rate is meant to be? Or how does your crossing gate know to stop at exactly 90 degrees? These values have to be stored somewhere to be recovered. And that's what we're looking at. Let's look at a domestic situation. You switch on your computer to type a letter. You load in your word processor and you type a document. You may print the document or you may email it but you want to keep a copy. So you have to save the document. You may save it to an ordinary hard drive or you may save it to a solid state drive which is comprised of memory. In fact, it's not only the document that will reside on your solid state drive, the program itself. When you load in your word processor, you're fetching it from the memory. When you switch the computer off, it's lost from the computer's memory, but it resides still in the drive memory, as does the document. Before we leave your computer, there's a third piece of storage. You've probably all seen this on your old computers. You have a battery backup that stores information like your date and time, like your boot sequence. Does it boot to your DVD first or your PC first or your USB stick first, whatever. That data is stored and battery backed up so that even when you switch the computer off, that information is still stored. So we have data stored in the battery backup and we have data stored on the solid state drive. And we have the application also stored on the solid state drive. We have the program, we have the data and we have various settings. There's three things that we want to store. And that's true also in the modelling world. Let's look at a couple of examples. You have a DCC decoder. And it's going to also have three different memory areas. One for the program itself. The decoder has to know how to handle commands and translate those commands into switching on and off accessories or switching off and on the motor drive. And that comes built into the decoder when you purchase it. And then there's the data itself. If the command in this example is to accelerate to a value of 90, it has to know what speed it's currently at, it has to know each step as it gets faster and faster, it has to know what its current position is, so it's constantly updating its own variables. These change as the program runs, but they're not permanent. When you stop using your DCC decoder, there's no more power to the decoder, these values are lost. And then finally, there's settings that you as a user can put into your decoder. For example, the rate of acceleration, the rate of deceleration, what the maximum speed of that particular local will be allowed to be. They're also stored on the decoder. And they are semi-permanent. You can switch off power to the, to the decoder, lift the local off the track, no more power, 
but they're still stored in the decoder. And they'll stay there forever unless you want to change the values in there. For example, changing the local address. So the program is permanent. The data is only used while the program is running and the settings are permanent unless you want to change their values. That's a DCC decoder. It's like that. We have the DCC come in from the track, which is rectified and smoothed and so on, filtered to provide the power both for the motor itself, the local motor, and also for a block of memory that will store the program, stores the data, and stores your settings. In this example, the data is the current data as the program runs, and the settings are all your CV values that you have decided to put into that decoder. We have here two DCC decoders, a larger size and a small one already mounted on a chassis. And we'll put it under the microscope and see what they actually are. Let's have a look. If I bring in the larger of the two decoders, we'll find that the main chip is in the top left-hand corner of the board that it's there. Top left-hand corner. Sometimes if we tilt the board a little, we can see it a bit better. There we go. It's a 12F629. It's a microchip pick chip. 12F629. Let's pull in the smaller of the decoders. It's already mounted on a chassis, so we'll have to refocus, see what it says. And it is a, a nat mill. It's a, it's a nat mill mega 168. So both DCC decoders have microcontrollers. Let's look now at servos, very common now on model railways for points, crossing gates, all kinds of animations, etc. Now these work by setting the end points, how far it, it will rotate in one direction and how far in the other direction. As you can see there, it depends on the width of the pulse coming into the servo. Narrower pulses take it one direction, wider pulses take it the other. So if we want to set up a servo's endpoints, we need some mechanism for doing it. One way, as we have here, is using software. You plug a serial cable into the servo foreboard and then you run the application and when you're finished you hit the button called write the data to the board and it's saved that way. That method of course requires the computer. Another way is the Servo 1 module, where you have a setting box, where you can set the two endpoints manually using potentiometers, twiddle the knobs, but when you're ready, yeah, you throw the switch to the set position. And then we have the Easy Bus module, where the output can handle up to eight servos, and their positions are set using push buttons. And when you get the settings you want, you click the button R to save the settings. 
so we can save the settings in software or via switches or via push buttons. Whichever way you choose, the results will have to be stored onto the servo controlling module. That module has to be able to retain the program that, that sends out the pulses and some of the data. The data that contains the two endpoints. But the computer you save to disk, as we said earlier, and microcontrollers were saving to an area of memory normally inside the microcontroller itself, although sometimes it can be external memory. Let's look now at types of memory. There are four main types you're liable to come across. The first is called flash, probably the most important of them. It's called a non-volatile random access memory. The non-volatile means that it doesn't lose its contents when the power is removed. And then there's static RAM, SRAM, which can store values, but these values are lost when power is removed. And then there's ROM, read-only memory, whose contents are fixed at the time of manufacture and are not able to be altered by the user. And a different kind of ROM which can be erased and overwritten. And that's the place where most of the data will be, will be stored. quick chart which shows that the flash memory, yes it can be read, yes it can be written to and it's, it saves its contents when the power switched off. SRAM can be read and written to quite happily but loses its contents at switch off. ROM can be read but can't be written to and it keeps its data when the power is removed. EEPROM does all three too. You can read it, you can write to it, and it maintains its contents on power off. The PIC uses flash, SRAM and EEPROM. The Nano and the UNO, which are both based in the app Megas, use flash, RAM and EEPROM. The Raspberry Pi Pico uses flash and RAM and ROM but, but no EEPROM. Here's a diagram showing the memory used inside a 12F675 microcontroller from Microchip. You can see there flash memory, RAM and EEPROM. And there's Inside the App Mega, again Flash, SRAM, and EEPROM. And the, the main chip that's used in the Pi Pico, the actual microcontroller, has ROM and RAM. But you'll see that you can add on external memory. And this the Pico uses 2 meg of flash memory on the PCB external to the microcontroller itself. And this table shows the relative sizes. The 12F675, which is getting a bit old in the tooth, has small amounts of flash. SRAM and EEPROM, whereas a modern version of it, the 18313, has got more flash, more SRAM, more EEPROM and runs a bit faster. The Nanos 
Again, I've got much more than the picks in terms of flash and uh, static RAM and EEPROM. And the Pi Pico is well endowed in that regard with two megabytes for the Pico compared to only one kilobyte for the 675. Much more SRAM. Doesn't use any EEPROM, as we'll talk about shortly, but does have 16K allocated to ROM. Out of interest, I also added in the speed that you're able to read and write and so on, that uh, the 675 runs at 20 megahertz and the Pi Pico can run at 133 megahertz, indeed can even be overclocked. You may be wondering why the Pi Pico in this chart doesn't have any EEPROM to store the settings. And that's to do with the way that the main processor communicates with memory. The techniques are known as the architecture. On the left we see what's known as Harvard architecture, where the main processor communicates separately with three different blocks of memory. The program memory, the working data memory and the stored memory in EEPROM. And that's what's used with the microchip PIC 12F675, the nanos and so on. On the right hand side we have what's known as the von Neumann memory. And you'll see there that the program and the data and settings can all be stored in the one memory block and the processor talks to that one block that shares all of the different types of data. And that's one way that the Pi Pico can perform. Let's look now how we would implement handling memory in a microchip PIC the 12F675. As we saw earlier, it's got 1K of program memory, 64th of working memory, and 128 bytes of EEPROM, like that. As a recap, the, the program memory is in flash. That's what the PIC kit does when you're saving a new program, you're writing it into the flash and it retains its contents during power down. The contents of the data memory only exist during the running of the program and those contents are lost when power is removed. The EEPROM, you can change the contents if you wish during the running of the program and again those contents will be retained during power down. So how do we do it in practice then? Well, we first have to, in the code, tell it that we intend to use the PIC data EEPROM library. That's the library of commands that allows you to read and write EEPROM. EEPROM always starts at location zero and goes up from there. And there are separate ways to handle it depending whether you're trying to write a byte at a time, a word at a time, or the larger double word. There's the procedures there. Data EEPROM write. Don't forget the underscores between each word. The offset is how far you are from zero and the X at the end is the, the value that you want to write into that location. Or you can write a word, or indeed a double word. There's an example where we're writing into location 0, the value 77, into location 169 and so on. 
in ASCII terms, that's M-E-R-G, there's Merg, one, two, three, four. These examples showed writing the values of variables X, A and B into EEPROM. If you wish, you can write to EEPROM still with the offset, but putting in a binary pattern, as shown here. So that's how to write to EEPROM, and these values will be stored when power is removed. When it comes to reading back from EEPROM, we just change the word write to read, data EEPROM read. There's two examples. We can read from offset 7 into variable x, or make y equal to the reading we get in location of set 4. Once again, we have procedures and functions for reading bytes, words, or double words. Let's look at an example from one of the pocket money kits. This is the sequencer, and that's just part of the code there. We have to include the library, as you see at the top there, include pick data EEPROM. And then when it comes time, we can write to various locations, whatever we've read in from the trimmer. And then they are stored, and from then on, the sequence timings will be, de will be determined by the delays that you've stored. And we've got a simple procedure at the start of the code that reads all the delay values that are previously stored. So unless you change them, you're now going to read from locations 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, five different values of delay, depending on what you've set them to be. So these examples are using JAL, but what if you're working with the Arduino IDE and you want to work with Nanos, Unos, etc.? Well, it's actually very similar. We still have the flash, the SRAM, we still have the EEPROM to write our settings to. And again, the write process looks very similar. You still have to even include a bit of different syntax in this case, but still include a library for handling EEPROM. And you still say EEPROM write where you want to go and what variable you're storing. In this example, we're storing mode, left, right, and servo speed variables. And those commands will put them into EEPROM for you. And then at the bottom, there's how we can read it back again. We simply say EEPROM read. And then give it the EEPROM location you want to read. And the value in there is copied into the variable called servo speed. Simple as that. And lastly, we have the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, we looked earlier at its memory and we noted that it's got SRAM, it's got flash, but there's no EEPROM, so we can't use the routines we looked at just a moment ago. Instead, it's got ROM. But ROM 
cannot be written to, is read-only memory. So we have to store values permanently in either SRAM or Flash. But we know that SRAM can't store data permanently. It's lost when the power is taken off. Therefore, we're only left with Flash itself. The ROM is there, 16 kilobit, just used for various routines and a couple of libraries. Plays no part in the storing of variables for our programs. It's got 264k of static RAM that's built into the RP2040 microcontroller. And we can use the SRAM to run programs and to store data, but not for permanent storage. It won't survive power down, but it's very handy for developing. If your program is and data will fit into 264, that is. Because SRAM has got what they call infinite endurance. You can write to it something like about approximately 100,000 times before it degrades. Whereas Flash will degrade after much less, maybe 20,000 write cycles. So when you're developing, you can actually run the programs in SRAM if they're small enough to test them. And then when you're happy that everything works, you can then store it permanently in the external Flash inside the Pico. There are two megabytes of flash memory on the Pi Pico board. And again, the programming data is in von Neumann architecture. They're sharing the same memory block. And the programs start from memory location zero. But at the high memory addresses, we can allocate 4K block or blocks to store values permanently. Not particularly easy task, but it's made better by a library that emulates an EEPROM. You'll recognize the kind of commands in that library, very similar to what we've looked at. EEPROM write, EEPROM read, etc. And behind the scenes, that library handles the memory allocation at the high end of the, the 2 megabyte block. And that allows us to treat the Pico in a similar way to we've treated the PIX and the Arduinos. So, that's how we save our various settings for servos in the Easy Remote Kit, the Servo 4 Kit, and our Turntable Kit, our Sequencer Pocket Money Kit, our Easy Bus Output Modules Kits, and hopefully useful information about how you can add into your own next project. Are there any questions, comments or suggestions? Thanks.